Thank you for joining us and welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Brown. I have the privilege of being the second chair for Stanford University's uh, Graduate School of Education's program on race, inequality, language, and education. And if you haven't noticed, today is a special day. We are here to celebrate our founding chair in the inaugural Dr. Arnitha Ball Lecture. Today, we just like to offer a, a token of our appreciation for a seed sown in our community. Uh, Dr. Ball has moved us from idea to action, has moved us from planning to execution, and has taken a, a program and created a community. And, and it is truly an honor to, to take the time to celebrate Dr. Ball. Uh, you left us with a standard of excellence uh, and an expectation that we should continue to expand upon the excellence that you've provided. And so as a Rao community, uh, I take great privilege in thanking you on the behalf of all of my colleagues and students in Stanford Graduate School of Education. So from our entire community, uh, we offer a sincere thank you, Dr. Ball. Uh, Dr. Anita Ball is the Charles E. Uh, DeCumman Endowed Professor Emerita in the Graduate School of Education. She holds a, a BA and a master's degree from the University of Michigan and a PhD from our own institution, Stanford University. She's a professor in the Curriculum Studies, Teacher Education and Educational Linguistics Department, as well as a social scientist in education programs. She's a former chair of the Ryle program and has served as the director for the African and African-American studies program here at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Ball has also served as the president of uh, the American Education Research Association. And if you had an hour, I can provide all of the list of awards. Uh, things that I like to note is Dr. Ball has spent well over 25 years changing the way that people conceive of literacy across the world, uh, a person who truly, truly walks the walk and talks the talk. And so in honor of her, we're going to name this lecture every year, the Dr. Anita Ball Ryle Lecture. Now, to offer our first speaker the appropriate introduction, I'm going to turn it over to one of our fabulous graduate students, Danielle Green. Danielle is a fourth year PhD student in our Ryle program who's studying majority black school closures and how that impacts schools. Her advisors are Dr. Adam Banks and Dr. Ball. Uh, Danielle, would you take it over, please? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I'm really excited to be here and so excited to introduce our inaugural speaker, uh, Dr. Cynthia Dillard. Dr. Cynthia B. Dillard, um, Nana Mansa II, Mpiasam, of Ghana, West Africa, is the Mary Francis Early Professor of Teacher Education at the in the Department of Educational Theory and Practice at the University of Georgia. Her research in interests include critical teacher education, spirituality in education, and African African American feminist studies. Beyond numerous published articles, book chapters, and scholarly presentations across the globe, two of her books on spiritual strivings, transforming an African and African American woman's academic life, SUNY Press, and learning to remember the things we've learned to forget in darkened feminisms, spirituality, and the sacred nature of research were selected as Critics' Choice Book Award winners by the American Educational Studies Association. Her fourth book, The Spirit of Our Work, Black Women's Teachers Remember, will be published in October 2021 with Beacon Press, which, by the way, is having a 30% off sale, and I will drop that information in the chat for everyone. In addition to receiving numerous awards for her teaching, service, research, and service, Dr. Dillard was awarded the prestigious Taylor and Francis AESA Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. She is also the recipient of the 2012 AERA Distinguished Contributions to Gender Equity and Education Research Award, given for her distinguished research and practices that advance public understanding of gender in education, and received the Division G Henry T. Truba Award at the 2016 AERA Annual Meeting. Dr. Dillard is also the director of the University of Georgia's Ghana Study Abroad in Education program and has founded and directs a preschool and elementary school in Mpiasam in the cent central region of Ghana, West Africa. There, she also holds the distinct honor of being installed as Queen Mother of Development for the village and esteemed lifetime leadership position of, of, uh, within the community. 
She also offers numerous and popular retreats to Ghana, West Africa through her small business, Full Circle Retreats Ghana. In addition, Dr. Dillard serves as the executive director and president of Give, Build, Share, a nonprofit organization designed to support educational opportunities for children and families by building schools in Ghana. Dr. Dillard looks forward to her next leadership position, and we are so very excited for you, Dr. Dillard, as Dean of the College of Education at Seattle University, beginning her tenure in February 2022. And with that, I give you Dr. Cynthia Dillard, our inaugural lecturer. Dr. Dillard, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. It says right in front of me, unmute yourself, but I didn't see it. Thank you so much for the reminder, Danielle, and for that beautiful introduction as well. Um, and, and I want to thank a few other people uh, too, starting first, uh, aside from Danielle, uh, starting first with the creator who woke me up this morning because I still have work to do and woke all of us up this morning because we still have work to do. And so I want to thank the creator first and foremost. And of course, I wanna thank the sister doctor we are honoring today, uh, Arnitha Ball. For many, uh, including myself, she has personified the importance of remembering for all of us, particularly remembering the continent of Africa in our walk as African-Americans. And I just wanna acknowledge uh, front and center, Arnita, the brilliance and beauty that you have represented for me and for so many around African and African-American culture, language and life. So thank you for your contributions and thank you for your friendship and thank you for your leadership as well. I also wanna thank everybody who has gathered together on this call um, because I don't know about all of you, but I've been on Zoom way too much this year uh, and and of course just trying to um, adjust to to getting back to life after the pandemic I don't know about you but I'm exhausted from zoom but I, I am grateful that you've gathered here together um, as we talk about the powerful energy and spirit very particularly of black women teachers like Dr. Ball we live that is black women live the black lives that are too offered often rendered invisible, but they can help us all, as Alice Walker says, find the work that our souls must do. So what does it take to be joyful in the work of teaching and learning and living? And I think that depends on who you ask. Often as students, staff and faculty, our first thought focuses on pursuits of the mind, on high achievement or being successful or on doing well. Missing is attention to what animates us or the spirit of our work. In the short time I have with you today, I wanna to explore the essential role of spirit in education, very particularly about how acts of remembering can be the spirit and commitment to being whole and being well in our work. This talk is drawn, as Danielle mentioned earlier, from my forthcoming book, The Spirit of Our Work, Black Women Teachers Remember, that's being published by Beacon Press. This work is based on a seven year study of black women teachers in our Ghana study abroad and education program and the joy and healing they experienced through what I've theorized as processes of remembering black cultural and heritage knowledge. And while my sister Arnitha has decided to retire and I have decided to spend a little more time in my career as a Dean, what you hear today is a preview of that book that marks the culmination in many ways of this part of my own academic life. It is a remembering of the most profound kind for me. So remembering as a concept is based on the idea that all peoples have ways of being and doing and knowing that are valuable and even necessary. But empire building and white supremacy have operated to dehumanize and distort in order to maintain interlocking systems of oppression. So we are required to remember, that is to think again, to recall, but also to gather and put back to get, together again, our true stories, our true brilliances and our true knowings. And everybody, 
in this moment is being asked to remember, given the lies that we've been told about our various lives and culture in order to understand how we got here, how we arrived, for example, at the challenges tragedies and traumas of the past year of racial injustice and what people are calling reckonings amidst a whole global pandemic. In plain sight, we see again that the negative outcomes always fall disproportionately on the backs and bodies of black people and other people of color. And while black women are not the only people who remember we do embody multiple intersectional and cultural identities that educational professionals need to know and learn from. Exploring the power and humanity of Black women as we articulate the conditions required for our healing and joy, my hope is that all who are gathered here today will be inspired towards the important re, and I'm, I'm putting re in parentheses there, re as in do it again, membering, putting back together that you also may need to do in order to be the teachers and educational professionals who black students deserve and whom all students need. But whether we're speaking of healing or joy or equity or justice, the road begins with looking back to look forward. It begins with remembering. Now, Ayikwe Arma, the great Ghanaian writer says this of the history of African people, a people that really includes African-Americans. He said, we are not a people of yesterday. Do they ask how many single seasons we have flowed from our beginnings until now? We shall point them to the proper beginnings of their counting. The air everywhere is poisoned with the truncated tales of our origins. That is also part of the wreckage of our people. What has been cast abroad is not a, a thousandth of our history, even if the quality were true, but the haze of this fouled world exists to wipe out knowledge of our way. Now, too often in the study of teaching and in teacher education, the study of teacher education, we approach discussions and research about race, gender, and education from a place where it's presumed that black people just happened to be here in the Americas just happened to be enslaved, just happened to have suffered more than 400 years of degradation and inequities. We speak and act as if these traumatic conditions occurred to an entire race of people and continue to occur without regard to the consequences and effects that such a legacy has on a people, particularly in relation to teaching, learning, and education. By extension, such narratives imply that it was just a symphonic simple, unfortunate set of circumstances that just happened in the United States of America instead of a systematic global structuring of privileges for some and marginalizations for others, conditions that have created the permanence of racism that Derek Bell tells us about, racial injustice and racial inequities worldwide. We need only look at these race, recent uprisings in the streets across the US and the world to be reminded, reminded again, thought again, of black people's continued and persistent resistance and revolution in the face of oppression. That insistence of our humanity is in our DNA. Now the impacts of racism and racial inequities on black women are all too often an invisible part of this legacy of oppression, especially in the literature on black teachers' lives and experiences. This is an invisibility that must be addressed. In my view, there's a different way to think about the presence and work of teachers for justice and teachers for equity. We can center that conversation about equity and justice education in the spirit of black women teachers who have thrived and loved in spite of our unmentionable and multiple oppressions. Black women have always marshaled and remembered the legacy of black people in relation to our spirits. And those rememberings have required us to lean on the substance of things unseen on our spirituality. And what scholarship has implicitly told us and what I have worked over the course of a career to lift up is that in order to face adversity, oppression and exclusions and remain insistent and steadfast in one's right to exist and to be, it is often our spiritual lives that have supported and affirmed and continue to support and affirm culturally relevant and sustaining practices in educational spaces with black students and their teachers. Spirituality here in this talk, I'm defining as being conscious of and paying attention to 
the order, power, and unity that flows through all of life and that encompasses an energy and responsibility greater than ourselves. For Black women, there are also three dimensions of spirituality that, that are worth lifting up and that Akasha Hole describes as a new spirituality of Black women that might be useful to our discussion today. She says first that Black women's spirituality includes our politics. Secondly, it includes our spiritual consciousness. And third, our creativity. So one's spirituality is also about using it to address, break down, and work to abolish structures and conditions that hamper liberation and freedom for Black people. Such labor requires great creative force and great creative energy. And speaking directly to the sisters now, it requires us as Black women teachers to remember who we are, our history, our culture, and contributions in ways that take into account the long history of Black life resistance, knowledge, and culture. Our work as Black women teachers has been and continues to be about attending to the spirit of those we teach, and at the same time, about talking back, as Hooks tells us, resisting and creating the education that we wished we had had for ourselves. But undergirding this labor, and often in very hostile climates, we must also remember who we are and whose we are in order to create more humane conditions in school and university communities. And when Black women are able and willing to marshal our spirits in pursuit of teaching and learning, everything we touch can be transformed, including our students' lives, all of our students' lives. So in the spirit of the wise stories that many of us have heard from people like Arnitha Ball, the stories we've heard as children at the feet of our elders and ancestors in our version of a village here in the U.S., like those we heard from older kids on our block, or at the knees of our mothers as they braided our hair, I wanna share with you all this collective story of how remembering is the spirituality of black women who teach. My hope is that today you too might be moved to remember, to call your very life back to, you, to yourself on behalf of the demands of this day, on behalf of black education, on behalf of the liberation and freedom of black people everywhere. But to do so, all of us will have to learn to remember the things we've learned to forget. That is the remembering that we will all need to get free. Now, given the dearth of literature on Black women teachers, it's the story of Black women educators that are highlighted, uh, that I want to highlight here today and in the book. The stories of teachers, higher ed professionals, school leaders, and teacher educators who engaged in processes of remembering the length and breadth, breadth of Black life from Ghana to the Americas and sometimes back again. For a scant few participants in our Ghana Study Abroad program, our trip simply added to the stamps in their well-used passports. That was a very few people. For some, the trip was the first time they had a passport at all, or in a few cases, the first time they had flown in an airplane. While all participants were moved, there was something absolutely transformational when the Black women educators touched down in Ghana. It was something about the way that it felt like home and not like home at the same time in a way that we immediately felt connections that we didn't expect. We saw in our own, our, we saw our own aunties and uncles faces in those of the Ghanaians walking down the street. And I know many of you have had this experience as well. We ate familiar food in new ways, could see the gumbo we knew in the okra stew that we ate there. We saw sisters in their Sunday best slang as they engaged their version of a church strut that we knew so well. As Tom Feelings wrote in his powerful children's book, I Saw Your Face, there was something about the influence and impact of accurately remembering pieces of yourself that transformed our bodies, minds, and spirits. As one participant described, it literally shifted the molecules in me. Being on the continent of Africa opened space and time for Black American teachers to know and embrace their spirituality as the common life-affirming core that runs through all facets of Black identity, through our bodies, minds, and spirits. We found in Ghana a place to situate ourselves as Black women teachers at our origins and to follow the roots and the twists of Black people we have become in the U.S. and beyond. We reveled in the ways our bodies, minds, and spirits just felt lighter 
in the fact that there was a place in the world where we could breathe that deeply. This lightness of being, this little bit of freedom from the weight of racism that we carry heavy in the US felt like balm to our souls. Remembering the beauty and power of Ghana quite literally transformed our visions of ourselves and our work as black women educators into clearer versions of ourselves and clearer visions of our work. Being in Ghana helped each of us to actually feel and find something that the late Intozaki Shange suggested is at the very core of a spiritual life, regardless of the name that you call spirit. She said, I found God in myself and I loved her. I loved her fiercely. Now at what Baldwin calls a merciful distance from the US, we learned that our Americanness, we learned about our Americanness, sorry, through the paradoxes we experienced on Ghanaian soil. We learned to feel and trust our African rhythms, the cultural memories buried deep in our DNA. In the sometimes overwhelming presence of economic poverty, we wrestled with the ways that worldwide systems of white supremacy, patriarchy, and economic domination manifest in ways similar and different in Africa and in America, but always inextricably connected to us. We stood witness to the horrors experienced by our ancestors, traveled the same path in our bus that they traversed in shackles. We stood on their remains in those dark dungeons where they died and survived in ways that forever changed the circumstances for African people on both sides of the water and quite literally created us as African or Black Americans. We quite literally stood on the shoulders of our ancestors. Now, this was not an easy walk. It was not an uncomplicated walk. We struggled with the lies and shames of the stories we had been told and the lies and shames that we had internalized as Black women. We were overpowered by perpetual waves of mourning, our relations and our ancestors that mirrored the ocean waves of this coastal country, the watery graves for so many who had come before us. And we experienced and learned through ways small and large, the ecstatic joy and our amazing grace as we met and talked and experienced what Ghana was to us and what we were to Ghana. And we were not alone on our journey because we could feel our legacies and lineages. We took every step with the creator and all of the ancestors who had walked before us with those in human form who stood beside us as we walked and with those spirits who will walk after us, we remembered. And when black women teachers remember everything, is possible. But hear me clearly. If justice and equity and healing are key in education, remembering cannot be optional for any of us. In a capitalistic, patriarchal, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, and we could continue, space like the US, interlocking systems of oppression do to Black people what they do to every people who do not have spaces to remember their longer histories on these shores. They trap us exactly where we are, where others want us to be, in the place of knowing only what others want us to know. They ensure that Black people are doomed to repeat the cycles of harm and limits that have been rained upon us. But they also trap those determined to maintain this status quo and makes them less than fully human as well. While Black people have definitely experienced that deep sense of loss, be clear as well that we are not lost. And as we remember our way, we have the opportunity to move into the greatness of our being on our terms. This is the recognition or the recognition, the rethinking that must find its way to the center of education for Black people on these shores as both teachers and as students. It is the kind of remembering that expands us, that moves us to become more fully human in the face of inhumanity, in places that still see and treat what Du Bois and Bettina Love call dark people as less than human. That is our work and must be our walk as Black people in the African diaspora and for those who love us. Such remembering pushes us to answer the question that the phenomenal writer Tony Cade Bambara asked us years ago and to truly hear her response about the meaning of our road to wholeness as a people. She said this, asked this question, are you sure sweetheart that you want to be well? 
I like to caution folks, that's all. A lot of weight when you're well, just so you sure, sweetheart, and ready to be healed, because wholeness is no trifling matter. A lot of weight when you're well. Through Bambara's voice, the questions of being well in our spirit and seeking our wholeness are made more important to consider for all of us who teach Black students. A lot of weight when you're well. It also means that we say yes to remembering the wisdom, history, and culture of Black people that we may not have even known that we needed, particularly given the, that many of our educational journeys were post-integration and as such were never really intended to center Black lives and story in the first place. It means we must stand firm in our wisdom and what we know to be truth, even as the world may tell us otherwise. It means we must honor the covenants that we have with the ancestors and with our traditions and our stories that did not begin on these shores, but have continued through us on them. Thinking about spirit, spirituality and wholeness is nothing short of radical in education, especially in the education of teachers. But frankly, black wellness, black wholeness, freedom are the only goals of an education that is worthy of black people. Remembering honors the complexity of that wholeness in the long history of Black life. That is where our playbook for today resides. And while the call gestures towards our arrival over 400 years ago, when 20 and odd enslaved African people were brought to Port Comfort, Virginia, our spirits and our stories as Black people began long before that moment. They began in our villages and home places in Africa. And our way to wholeness in diaspora begins by turning those slave ships around and returning to where we began. Now this return is about the journey back to ourselves, to that place where we were first known and first loved. And as Bell Hooks says, where the arms that held us hold us still. What I've come to know as a researcher, when our collective story as Black people begins on the continent, where our ancestors were born, a profound healing begins there for us too. We find spaces to reject the lies and untruths that have been told to us and that have been taught to us for centuries about who we are. We can lay those burdens of racism and sexism and all the other things down and name our pain and suffering as well as our joys and triumphs. We replace what's in our minds and hearts about who we are by affirming our humanity and our spirits against a backdrop where Audre Lorde says, I feel, therefore I can be free. Like our African ancestors, we can begin to create ourselves as black women who know that we in fact were our ancestors' wildest dreams. In a recent dissertation proposal meeting of a, a sister here uh, who's, who was a, an alumni of the Ghana Study Abroad in Education, a program, I learned yet another lesson. I asked, we'll call her Rita, to share a bit more about the criteria that she was using to select participants for her study. She talked through the criteria quite brilliantly and at the very end shared a question that has stayed with me since. She said she selects her participants based on a simple question. Who has more of the story to tell? And in a commitment to remembering the person with more of that story to tell is you. Every human being has a heritage and a cultural knowledge inside of them. We use it every day in every decision we make as teachers. And not all of it is something to be proud of. Some of these memories and ways of being are painful. Others might be joyful. Sometimes they scare us, making us afraid to explore those inner depths. But how can we teach if we do not know what has brought us to this place? The stories of our ancestors' movements and migrations, how we came to be who we are and the legacies that we embody. To seek justice and equity in education is to lay those wounds and triumphs bare, the ones inside of us and those inside of our ancestors. Because our healing is next to those wounds as individuals, as a collective, and certainly in the systems of education where we work. And until we can remember and cry for the legacy of inequities and harm caused to Black people and others, name that harm, and then actively work to repair it, 
we will never be whole regardless of the plethora of new models of practice that we wanna use in education. And as teachers, our spirits will never be well enough to teach all of our students. Today, as often is the case, I have explicitly focused my attention on black women teachers experiences. But if you listen deeply and want to learn from the power and humanity of black women, you will find lessons that all of us need to know to be the teachers that black students deserve and that all students need. First, black women and our experiences offer you the invitation to remember. That's the first lesson. And that's the invitation that you must also be able to offer to your students. So before you plan a lesson, develop any curriculum or a syllabus, as their teacher, your own inner life must be well. As the person responsible for your students' well-being and wholeness in mind, body, and spirit, you too must be whole. Not perfect, I'm not saying that, but having spent considerable time in reflection, careful study, and examination of your spirit, your knowledge of the spirit that animates the children you teach and the values embedded in the long traditions of their people. Like the Hippocratic Oath where medical doctors pledge to first do no harm, we must know who black people are lest we unknowingly do harm. And we know that's happening to black children in their educational experience. So before you begin to teach black students, you might start by asking yourself a couple questions. And all of these things I've, I've uh, explicated a bit more fully in the book, but let me just share a couple of questions you might wanna consider. First, when I think of my close friends and colleagues, are there black women or black people in that group? Why or why not? Have I ever talked about our racial differences and really listened to what they were telling me? If I'm a white person, is there a knot in my gut as I talk about blackness and black people? And how did that not get there? How do I describe that knot to other people? And how does the act of doing so open up a productive dialogue with others, particularly uh, across differences? What is my life experience with black women or black people, not just in the US, but across the globe? What additional experiences might I need to have in order to understand black life more fully? And how do I responsibly and respectfully have these necessary experiences? Remember, this isn't an exhaustive list, but simply offered as an invitation to begin to tap into your own spirit as a necessary first step to your teaching. It's also an invitation that is given to teachers of all racial, ethnic, and social identities, an invitation to do the courageous and important work of looking at yourself and what you know before you grab onto the brilliant curricular frameworks in the black tradition, like Goldie Muhammad's new Cultivating Genius that many folks I have read, Gloria Latson Billings, The Dream Keepers, uh, Django Paris and Samuel Liam's Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies, Rich Milner's Start Where You Are But Don't Stay There. Those frameworks will help you, but only if you come to them with a wholeness that allows you to actually lift up those frameworks usefully and relevantly for the students you teach. Secondly, black women offer you the power of sanctuary. While this talk rests on black women's remembrance of the roots of African-American culture and traditions in the sanctuary that Ghana really was for us. Generations of our grandmothers and aunties have left us a plethora of texts that provide glimpses into various sanctuaries that black women have created and experienced in this long walk that we're still doing towards freedom. Authors like Aben Abusia, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Paula Marshall, Maya Angelou, Nayira Wahid, and Lucille Clifton have been sanctuary for me, providing models of how to breathe and how to resist oppression and to build on behalf of our freedom as Black people. They have been hush harbors in the harshness of a world that too often renders us invisible as Black women. But remember, in addition to being a refuge or a quiet place for our minds, bodies, and spirits, as enslaved Black people during that particular time in our history, hush harbors were also spaces where we remembered who we were and whose we were. We found joy and purpose in those remembered rituals of praise in song and in dance and in prayer. It was our place to be affirmed in community with other Black people and to commune with the spirits of our ancestors. It was a space where our bruised and wounded souls could be healed and a world that embraced 
Black humanity could be created again. Those spaces, whether through literature or gatherings or in our spaces of contemplation alone, are how we remember Black humanity when the hurt and hate is too much. We know that our Black lives matter. That's not new to us. What we need in schools and educational spaces are some modern day hush harbors, spaces of remembering that also know that particular truth. If as a teacher, you will join in that struggle for education and freedom that creates that kind of a sanctuary for black students in our communities, please know that the struggle that you are joining did not start today. Folks are out here acting like this is all brand new uh, over the last couple of years. This is not a today struggle. You will need to make a serious and ongoing commitment to critically studying and unpacking the length of the hurt, harm, and danger that you may have endured and in other cases that you may have caused or benefited from. As a teacher, you will need your own sanctuary to do this work, leaning on no one to teach you what you do not know as a shortcut to the actual gift that critical studying and remembering can be for your spiritual and intellectual growth and development. That is the gift of sanctuary. It's a place where you can search again, you can vision again, you can think again, present yourself again, and ultimately claim and live legacy again. Who is a part of that sanctuary or that sacred community you create might vary, but it, will, it may need to be made up of a racially or culturally homogeneous group at first. We all have a lot of healing work to do within and around those who share these cultural and racial and social identities. That's just fine. The key in sanctuary is to struggle, is to wrestle with the hurt, harm, and danger, and the joy, resilience, and strength of your ancestors, and acknowledge and remember, even revise, in some cases, your covenants with them. Here are a few questions as you begin your work in sanctuary that might be helpful for you as well. How do I hold differences in the story that I'm stories that I'm reading or experiencing uh, experiences that I'm having with blackness sacredly? How do I hold that with some sort of sacred nature without judgment or denial? Can I rest in place in these experiences where it is not always about me, not about what I know or feel, but empathetic enough to imagine a differing reality? Are humility, sacrifice, and selflessness at the center of my desire to know Black stories, Black culture, Black people, or am I collecting exotic stories to tell? And how does what I thought I knew about diverse Black people match what I'm now hearing from actual engagements with diverse Black people? Finally, Black women offer up and need, um, offer up the need and the example of living in the spirit of Black legacy. What I have found in this work with the Ghana Study Abroad students and, and faculty was that different groups had different outcomes in their processes of remembering. For Black folks, usually in Ghana Study Abroad, I would characterize their work as the work of recovery, recovery as being about repairing the spiritual, cultural, and material damages to ourselves and our communities through engagement with African heritage and culture. Our work as black teachers was about standing in the brilliance and strength of the legacy of black people unabashedly with no apologies and no permission needed. For many of my white students, their ability to live black legacy in the spirit of being the co-conspirators that Bettina Love talks about could be characterized as an uncovering of the history and culture of black people that they did not know, in some cases could not imagine. This included the hard work of acknowledging legacy of, legacies of inhumanity wrought by their ancestors. Their work was about developing a new covenant with those ancestors and thus with humanity, a new covenant that recognized, recognized, fought again, the harm perpetrated against black life and then actively worked to abolish and repair it in honor and in struggle. It required active work towards justice versus simple acknowledgement or guilty feelings about injustice. Living Black legacy requires that you both be able and willing to reclaim the legacy of Black and African people and take your place in living this legacy in the work of being a teacher. But living Black legacy necessarily requires risk. 
sacrifice and strength, as well as joy and an Ubuntu spirit to do the work. It requires abolition and freedom. It requires that we work with every breath to show up whole. Regardless of the skin that we are in, a fundamental test for all of us will be this. As we create lessons or programs or lectures, will diverse groups of Black people recognize our efforts to reclaim Black legacy? In other words, will Black people be able to see that your efforts are centered in Black humanity and legacy as Black people have experienced it, not just today, but for centuries? Here are a few more questions to consider as you begin your work in reclaiming and living Black legacy. One, what do Black stories mean to me? And what emotions and memory do they evoke? Secondly, what are the structures in place that have been and continue to be oppressive to Black people? How do I work diligently to tear them down and do my part to create sanctuary for those most harmed as we rebuild structures of freedom for all? When someone sees my teaching work finally, how will they know, see, feel, or experience that I have approached this project with reverence for Black lives, culture, and stories? These are some of the gifts that the Black women teachers have given us. But a gift is only a gift if the receiver accepts it in recognition that you have remembered us. But as Pamela Newkirk shares about her book of intimate letters from African-American peoples post-emancipation. She says this, a history of disparaging portrayals in popular culture has surely contributed to the reluctance by African-Americans to expose our inner lives. This reticent po reticence poses a challenge for scholars seeking to depict the fullness of African-American life and makes all the more precious the contributors to the pages in her book. I hope that my words have filled in a bit of that story. But who has more of that story to tell? My dear colleagues, you do. You have something to contribute to this great story of remembering who we are together. I want to end with our legendary poet, Lucille Clifton, who is calling us all to do just that in her poem, poem entitled, Why Some People Be Mad at Me Sometimes. She says, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I keep on remembering mine. Remembering, that remembering is where we must begin. And it is not optional for those of us who teach. It is essential and so is education. I wanna thank you, Arnitha Ball, for your model of that kind of re remembering. And I wanna thank everyone on this call for their kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dillard. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we are so grateful for to you for such a critical lecture. Um, it's so incredibly powerful. So thank you. I also want to remind everyone I dropped in the link. If you use this code SPIRIT30, um, you can receive her forthcoming book, The Spirit of Our Work, um, Black Women Teachers Remember. And re is in parentheses, if you like. So uh, from here, we're going to move to the next portion of our uh, event today. It is the inaugural um, Dr. Arnitha Ball uh, Ryle Lecture, and we have a few special guests um, from over the course of Dr. Ball's life who are tasked with helping us honor her with some short statements. So uh, first, we will have Dr. John Rickford, the former J.E. Wallace Sterling Professor of Linguistics and the Humanities at Stanford University and colleague and mentor of Dr. Ball for many years. He will start off our remarks honoring Dr. Ball. Dr. Rickford, a leading scholar on African-American language and member of the American Academy of Arts was recently elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences, the first from our Department of Linguistics here at Stanford. So just before Dr. Rickford starts, Dr. Ball doesn't know this. So this is all a surprise to her, just as this is a surprise for you. So Dr. Rickford, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure to honor Professor Anita Ball with the Royal Lecture Series being very appropriately named after her. I want to say two short things about her you may not know. 
a third that some of you may know, and a fourth that is a little more familiar. I've known Anita since she was a graduate student. I was co-chair of her dissertation in 1991, just 30 years ago. And indeed, together with Renee Blake, who's now a professor at NYU, and two other students, we co-authored and delivered a paper called Rapping on the Copula <laughs> Coffee, which was very much cited in literature when we published it later in 1988. Notably, we summarized our conclusion in the form of a six verse rap. rap. Rap was very popular then, beginning then, and uh, with, with beatbox rhythms. And I want to give you just the first verse. Folks who, this is, I'm not gonna try to rap it again now. <laughs> Folks who study the copula tend to forget that the method you use affects the results that you get. In the case of is and are, it doesn't seem to matter whether you study them apart or we study them together. We had a lot of data to back these conclusions. Maybe I'll ask Anita to wrap it again sometime. <laughs> um, secondly, Anita started um, the Center for Ethnicity and Race, CREAL, with it Sami Alim and myself in 2010. We hosted a big symposium later on and co-edited the proceedings as Racial Linguistics in 2020. Thirdly, some of you may know this, Anita is also the mother of three beautiful and brilliant daughters, Anika, Alina, and Ayana, whose lovely smiles reveal what a great mom and dad they have. Finally, Anita has been a terrific advisor to students working in Ryle. I have been on many committees with her and seen firsthand the ways in which she has enriched the work. She will be very sadly missed now that she is retired. And, but the Arnita Ball lectures will allow her influence and influences to live on. Thank you, Arnita. Congrats. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rickford. Next, we have words from Dr. Cheryl Brown, the current Assistant Vice Provost for Residential Education here at Stanford. Dr. Brown worked in close collaboration with Dr. Ball for many years as the Program Director of African and African American Studies, while Dr. Ball was the Faculty Director there. Thank you, Danielle. It is such an honor to be here. Um, I just wanna start by saying that the lecture was amazing. I feel like I've walked along Dr. Ball and I just get blessed all the time and today was no different. So to carve out this time truly has blessed me. So thank you um, for those words. I, you know, I was welcomed to Stanford as Brian's wife uh, to Dr. Ball's home. And that was like my first, I feel like that was my first real welcome to Stanford was getting to go to your home. I was still a grad student at the time, but I felt like we had really truly been welcomed into the community that day. And so I think from there, I had no idea that we would work together. Mm -hmm. um, but a then several years later, uh, you became the faculty director of um, AAAS, and it really did, I think, transform me in a lot of ways. I just want to talk a little bit about that and what I think is not just unique to me, but the ways in which you walk alongside people and lift them um, in their work and in their lives. And so um, I was, had only been the associate director for one year, and you walked in and you treated me like a partner. You believed in me. Um, and you lifted me up in a lot of ways. And I think the ways in which we work together really gave me the confidence to grow into the person that I am today. And I, I really do uh, believe that your encouragement, your support, your partnership, and the things that you modeled, um, that you, not just you spoke about, but I could see in your life really shaped who I am and so many others. And so I truly cherish the time that we had together. We hosted lecture series, which introduced me to a number of amazing people you knew. We co-taught classes, we advised students, we even traveled to Cape Town. I think outside of Brian, you're the only person I've traveled this long with. I was like a whole 10 days with Dr. Ball. It was amazing. Um, and the whole time was amazing. And I believe that, you know, at that time I was early in my career, just having you as a model, as a brilliant, bold black woman who had accomplished so much in your personal life and your professional life and specifically at, at Stanford, was just amazing to kind of spend that time with you. 
Um, and what I loved about this is I, I mean, even stories about raising your kids. I have high, we have high schoolers now. And I think what, what did Dr. Ball say she did in high school to support her kids? So just the things that you have poured into my life just by sharing who you are. One of the things that is, is not unique to me though is I think that you do this with the, so many people. I've watched you lift people's careers, encourage them to share their work, built them up and, and shared their work with the intellectual community and in here at Stanford specifically. And so I just think it's been amazing to see how you encourage people to grow, to be authentic, but also to grow in their careers and believe in themselves. Um, and so you encourage other people to do work, but you do the work. I will say that Arnita works hard. Whether it is doing global research or leading Triple S, I mean, she was doing this all at the same time, president of ARA. I remember being at ARA and being like, I'm just, just being near you, I felt special, right? But just the fact that you were doing all of these things, um, I kind of would joke to myself as someone who was what I would consider young and enthusiastic, like, I can't even keep up with Dr. Ball. The amount of <laughs> energy and how much you poured into things, but you've never um, kind of step back from the work. And I think that's just absolutely amazing because you care so deeply. Um, it has been great to see you step up to do the work when it's seen and unseen. Um, and, and, and it doesn't go unnoticed though. It may not be seen, but it doesn't go unnoticed the impact that you've had on students' life, the way that you've furthered the field, the, you've mentored another generation, you, you continually address racism that impacts education for for the use for teens, for scholars, for researchers, like at every level, and that you care deeply about how we even get to do this work together in community. So I cannot thank you enough for who you are and who you've been in my life. Even years later, I knew I could turn to you. Can I just get some advice? And you made time for me. <laughs> um, and I know you do it for so many. And I just want to thank you. And but also thank you for making it fun. I know we've all had fun with Dr. Ball, and I'm sure some of our other speakers will talk about that. But I love you from the bottom of my heart, and I appreciate you and everything that you've been to me and so many others. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Third, we will hear from Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, the former Kellner Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and faculty affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Danielle. And uh, again, thank you, Cynthia, for that important, important lecture. And uh, I'm going to pay full price just because I want to pay full price for that book. Thank you. Uh, Arnitha, I can hardly remember a time when I didn't know you. Uh, I recall, however, when I first met you. And that was me coming back as a brand new uh, graduate from Stanford to give the Dean's Brown Bag Lecture and you were there. And I gave my little talk and I was ready to get out of there and go home and you came running after me and just, just start pummeling me with questions. Well, how did you do this? And how did you do that part? And I would describe Arnitha and this is, she's a linguist. So I, the, the word I wanna use, I'm not using it as a pejorative, but she's like a barnacle. When she latches on, She's not getting off. She is not getting off. And it's been really the pleasure of my career to have her right there all along. Um, I was just smiling at the intro. I said, man, Arnitha is one of the few people who's had more hairstyles than me. I mean, I was watching them transitions from the big fro to the little fro. And I was like, OK. Uh, Arnitha's had a lot of hairstyles, too. Uh, but she's such an, an incredibly smart person. I mean, I, I think, you know, we talk about all of the, the, the uh, personal qualities, but she has a brilliant mind. And I don't ever want us to forget that. The other thing that's special is that she has one of the dopest husbands I know. Fred is my man. I need to know every time we talk, I like, how Fred doing? Tell Fred I did this. Tell Fred I, I asked about that. We talk about cars, we talk about investments. He's such a good person, but he's also a reflection of her and also her beautiful daughters. Just, you can see Arnitha's spirit radiate through those young women. Um, and one of the things I really, really love about Arnitha is she will ask the question in a minute. You know, she'll say, well, well, what are they doing? Well, what did they say? Well, 
how did they come up with that? And I just love that she never shies away from asking the critical question. Um, I had the pleasure last year of actually finally writing something with Arnita. We never did that before. We've been friends for a long time. So that was really a wonderful way for me as a part of the culmination of my career to uh, get something in print alongside her. Uh, I think naming this particular um, lecture series after you is the exact perfect thing to do. Uh, not just because of all the work you've done, but Stanford needs it. Stanford needs your name to remain in perpetuity. And I'm so delighted that this was a decision that was made. So I love you, honey, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Latson Billings. Next, we will hear from Dr. Tondika Chapman, a Sophie, Associate Professor of Education Studies at the University of, Sa of University of California, San Diego. Dr. Chapman is a former student of Dr. Ball from their time at the University of Michigan. So hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I had to put on my um, stopwatch because Danielle said that I get like a minute and what you're asking me to do ostensibly is to describe my entire career in a minute because Arnie the Ball is the beginning of my career. So I started um, as that next leg of the legacy that Dr. Rickford, you started with being Arnitha's graduate student. And I was her graduate student in my master's. I only went to get my master's degree because my mom told me I had to before I started teaching so that I could at least make a living wage with a master's degree in the, in the um, in the classroom. And what I, what I found out because Arnitha was my uh, advisor was I actually, one, I found out what education research was. I didn't know it was a thing. And then I found out that I loved it and that I wanted to go ahead and pursue later on after being a teacher, being a researcher and what that looked like. I didn't have a model for what that looked like. Arnitha gave me that model even though she did make me transcribe the entire film, Daughters of the Dusk, it was still a great, an amazing response, an amazing beginning to what has been now, what, 25 years, no, 30 years of working together and building different things together and research and practice and presentations and Anita has brought me along every step of her journey. And I have just been so really pleased and um, overwhelmed and grateful that she considers me part of her family, that she considers me a part of her, her legacy of scholarship. I often joke that I'm the um, oldest of the four girls, that there are not just three, that I get that place as the fourth. Um, and I think that, I. I have Fred's permission to do that and sign off as well. So um, I'm excited about that. And it's really exciting to have Danielle be a part of this legacy because when Danielle came to me at UCSD and I was trying to recruit her and she told me, well, Dr. Ball is, um, might be my advisor at Stanford. I said a couple things that we shouldn't put on record. And I was like, okay, let me call Arnitha right now and get you an appointment with her because you're going to Stanford. There's no way that I can do for you what Arnita did for me and now it's gonna do for you. And so it's just really amazing to have this legacy, to be a part of it. Arnita, you know, I love you. Thank you a thousand times for all of the things, all of the adventures, all of the dance parties, all of the music, all of the, all the snickering in the corner. Um, and and the, the comments and the just the wealth of knowledge academically, intellectually, spiritually, personally that you've given me. And I'm way over time, but that's just going to have to be okay. I love you, Tandika. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chapman. We know that we're running up against time, but we're so thankful that you're here with us. We have two more guests uh, guests who were wanted who will be speaking next. We have words from a great friend of Dr. Ball, Dr. Carol Lee, the Edwina S. Terry Professor of Education and Social Policy, excuse me, the former Edwina S. Terry Professor of Education and Social Policy, Professor of Learning Sciences, and Professor of African American Studies at Northwestern University. My sister. 
<laughs> hey, Arnita. I just got an email from Fred as you as this was going on. <laughs> I'm on grandma duty. So okay. if if something emerges when the, the three-year-old wakes up, uh, you may hear some things in the background. That's one reason I look so like uh, not like Gloria today. <laughs> But um, Arnita and I have actually been on this journey actually together. We, we got our degrees at the same time uh, in 91. And from her work at the University of Michigan through the work at Stanford, we have, our careers have been intertwined and our personal uh, lives uh, intertwined. Uh, she has a fabulous, interesting husband and I have a fabulous, interesting husband who know <laughs> each other as well. Um, she has three beautiful daughters. I have three children, one daughter, and, but two, two. And we're grannies together. It's like all these things began, were always intertwining, ha happening at, you know, at the same time. We both cut our wings on the National Council of Teachers of English, right. uh, Standing Committee on Research. Um, when we were both uh, vice presidents of different divisions in AERA, we set a wonderful standard of having real parties. <laughs> where folks would dance and graduate students would come out and look that's Arnita Ball she's out there dancing like really <laughs> um on through you know the other work with with AERA one of the things that we did that I always um say to to young scholars coming up was that we cited one another mm -hmm. always when we published we would uh, propose symposium for conferences you know together if any of us heard anything about tenure situations, we would share those with one another. Uh, we went to South Africa together, leading co -leading, leading a people to people delegation uh, to South Africa. Um, so we, we have just been climbing this ladder and now we're walking into emeritus status together uh, uh, in fake, what I know is fake retirement for both of us. <laughs> um, and um, uh, the other thing I, when I think about uh, Arnitha too is her uh, carrying her family forward when they have lived literally all over the country at different points in time, but has still have been able to coordinate and keep that family strong and focused. And her daughters are, you know, as Gloria and Tandeka have mentioned, are, are like little mini Arnithas uh in the sense that they love black people they are extraordinary uh, mothers themselves and extraordinary professionals and i think the last thing that i you know sort of like to say about our Nita that nobody has that everybody knows is our Nita is a take no prisoner like if anybody that you don't want to mess with is our Nita ball because she will put you in your place real 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 quick um, I think again that it is wonderful that this series, this lecture series is named in her honor. And as Gloria has said, I think she has made an indelible stamp on Stanford University uh, Graduate School of Education. It is a place that is qualitatively different than when she arrived because of her, of her presence and all of the initiatives that she's done. And she lives on both certainly in, in, in her scholarship but also in the many students that she's mentored who have gone on to have stellar careers as Tandeka and others have as well. So, uh, you know, as the old folks say, uh, dear sister, she's a good religious sister. <laughs> she, is, she really is. Um, job well done, good and faithful servant. We say that early, we won't wait till <laughs> a later time that they normally do that. Uh, but I love you, Arnitha. You know, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey together. And uh, we'll look forward to find new things to do together Absolutely. as we walk into retirement. You, Gloria, and I are all in fake retirement. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. you. Love you. And we missed grandson is still asleep. This is good. Ah, this is good news. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee. And finally, we would be remiss if we did not conclude these remarks with an opportunity for the Ball family to offer, offer words to Dr. Ball. Here to represent their family is her daughter, Dr. Anika Ball Anthony, the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and the Associate Professor of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. Oh my goodness. 
Hi, Mom. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> On behalf of the family, we are thrilled to celebrate with you today. Um, we do know how much you have truly valued your time as a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Education and as the chair of RAL. From the one-room schoolhouse that your father and his siblings attended in Mississippi, all the way to the broad impact that you have had as a leading scholar on teacher education and issues of race, culture, and linguistic diversity in education, we can truly say that you are more than a conqueror. Thank you for sharing your commitment to equity and education with your children, your nieces, nephews, grandchildren, uh, youth that you have taught over the years and teacher educators all over the world. Specifically from your three daughters, Ayana, Alina, and myself, we thank you for investing in us, for showering us and our children with love, and for teaching us to value ourselves, how to support one another, and very critical and important life skills. We look forward to an extended family celebration, um, probably via Zoom, and then we'll celebrate again when we're all together in person. And lastly, um, the family would like to thank Dr. Brian Brown and the Ryle and Graduate School of Education leadership team for naming this uh, series in honor of our mother. Uh, we thank you, Dr. Dillard, for the amazing uh, speech that you gave today. You were a fabulous inaugural speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ball Anthony. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Dillard for your lecture um, and all of our special guests for helping us to honor Dr. Ball today. I now wanna open the floor to Dr. Ball for a few words uh, as we conclude. Just a few words I just want to, um, to share. I wanna begin by thanking you all. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, John, my mentor, who taught me everything I know about education. To be a good scholar, how important that was. John, this is so important, thank you. But I wanted to begin with just a few notes by saying that it's been an honor to be a part of the Academy for, as Carol has said, almost 30 years, or maybe over 30 years. I, I didn't count them up in preparation for today. And I'm honored to have been a part of Stanford University for the last 20 years. And even more so, the crowning glorious to have been a part of Ryle for at least, what, the last 10? Somewhere between five and 10 years because we've been having conferences for the last five years. We had the fifth conference um, recently. So it's been a great honor. Um, I've I haven't seen the Dean, but I wanted to thank him for his support for the work that Ryle has been able to do. I wanna thank the Ryle faculty. It has been such a, a, a pleasure to work with all of the members of the GSC, but also in particular, the Ryle faculty, because you brought your interdisciplinary skills, your knowledge, your passion, your humanity to the study of issues related to race, culture, language, and inequality. And it's so needed in the world today. So I'm so thankful for that faculty, but I'm also so thankful for the memories going back, Tandaka and Jamal Cooks. I believe you were my first students to go through. What a honor. Uh, Tandaka is a noted scholar, worldwide for her work and Jamal is a leader in the field as well. And I'm thankful for my, my colleagues. Carol, thank you so much. Gloria, thank you so much. Um, other, other colleagues that I, I just wanted to mention was, um, uh, oh, thank you, Cynthia, Cynthia Dillard, Cynthia Tyson, um, and so many more. I just wanna thank you for for the humanity that you have brought, as Dr. Dillard said, remembering, when I remember this journey, I'm so thankful that each of you are a part of those memories because you made the work bearable and powerful and passionate 
and worthwhile. And as I've said in one of my um, um, dedications of my, my book, my grandchildren are my motivation for the work that I've done because I want education to serve them and all the students in their generation and thereafter. So um, I wanted to thank my students and I've been seeing, um, I didn't know what was going on when I saw, heard uh, from some of my colleagues, but uh, I wanted to thank those folks at, 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 at Stanford. I wanted to thank Danielle, Ephraim, Xavier, uh, Tiara, uh, Patrick Kamanyang, who has made an impact on my life, Ment mentees that I've had, Charmaine and Keith, Jamal, Katrina, Oh, all of you are so important. Carla, I can't mention you all, but I am so proud of you because you are unapologetic leaders and you will take this field where it needs to go. We are depending on you. And I'm so proud to have been a part of what, how we can shape the future of education. Um, over the years, um, we've, we've impacted so many uh, different uh, people through Ryle, and I want to thank Brian for the vision that he's bringing. And we've done, we were ahead of our time, but I'm not worried. It's going to move to even higher heights because of the leadership of Brian, because of the Ryle faculty, because of the faculty in the GSE because of my colleagues and my students. And I want to say one more name, Terrence Turner. We could not do the work that we do without the support and the work of Terry. Thank you so much, Mr. Terrence Turner, for all that you do uh, to make the work possible. I wanted to uh, end by saying that, um, you know, I'm thrilled that my friend and colleague, Dr. Cynthia Dillard was presented such a powerful inaugural talk. We got so much out of it. I was taking notes. Thank you for helping us to remember. Thank you for taking us to new heights, realizing that we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. And I'm so thankful that there will be other speakers like Cynthia Dillard, who will be speaking in future years. You will be speakers who will bring the truth, who will speak truth to power. And this is a good way to move into retirement. Thank you for each of you who have honored me today. Thank you to Stanford, to Ryle, and I'm not going away. You'll hear more from me in the future. And I look forward to those travels, Carol and Gloria, as we move forward and continue to lend support to our oncoming generation. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Ball. It has been an honor of my lifetime to have you as my advisor. Um, and with that, we would like to conclude our 2021 Ryle Speaker Series. Uh, we hope to see you all in the fall for the 2021 Ryle Conference. Thank you. <laughs>